Welcome to another edition of the Invisible Wheelchair Interview Podcast. I'm Donald Grodoff, family coach with FamilyOCD.com, FocusedHealthyFamily.com, and of course, InvisibleWheelchair.com. In the Invisible Wheelchair Interviews, I get the wonderful chance to interview some of the experts with obsessive compulsive disorders, professionals that treat OCD, people who are going through or have been through OCD, parents and caregivers of those suffering from OCD, and of course anyone that advocates for treatment of OCD. My goal of these interviews is to inform people on all aspects of OCD and bring about awareness of obsessive compulsive disorder. The content, information, resources, and ideas that are talked about and brought up here in these interviews are not necessarily the views and opinions of myself, Family OCD, Focused Healthy Family, and Invisible Wheelchair Podcast. And I always recommend to seek additional professional help in finding solutions for yourself. You can find out more about me at FamilyOCD.com, FocusedHealthyFamily.com, and InvisibleWheelchair.com. This Invisible Wheelchair podcast interview was recorded March 7, 2019. This interview is a very special interview for me. It's very close to my heart. Today I, I got a chance to interview my wife, Gina. We've been married for 25 years, and she has parten- partnered with me in raising our kids, and now she's actually partnering with me in our practice called Focused Healthy Family. And I wanted to be able to give to, the, to my audience here the opportunity to hear the other side of the story uh, on our journey through my, my daughter's OCD. So I'm so glad that she's been able to share with me today her side of it, to give her viewpoint on things. We did a bio based on our practice, and I'd like to read that to you for her intro. Gina brings to the practice her knowledge and experience as an occupational therapist since 1992, her insights as a homeschooling mom since 1997, a lifetime of journaling and writing that has evolved into a parenting blog, a former La Leche League leader, and her desire to empower others on their parenting journey. Now, let's go to the interview. So I'm I'm really glad you're able to do this with me today. you know, my, this audience has heard my voice over and over again, and I, I think it's important to get the other side of our, our story. And so I'm, I'm glad you are doing this with me today, Gina. I'm glad to be here. So what I'd like to start out with is if you'd be willing to share when you first uh, experienced the, the OCD issues that we had with, with our daughter. Gina, what I was going to ask you to do is if you could share your first experience that you uh, had with um, what we went through with our daughter with the OCD. What I first remember with Abby's OCD is there was a time when she early on, that she felt the floor was dirty and she couldn't step on the floor. And I have a memory of when her friend was sleeping over and it just her anxiety escalating over not being able to touch the floor. And we had the idea to take a bunch of throw rugs and put them down to make like a pathway. I think we made a game out of it. I mean, she was eight years old at the time and it was a temporary fix so she wouldn't be freaking out about the, the dirty floor. And I knew how embarrassing it was having her, you know, best friend there and having and struggling through it. Um, we had so much to learn at that point, you know, not realizing the beha- what we were doing for her was compensating for the OCD and kind of feeding it. I, when I think back to the beginnings of it, I, I remember that time in particular. How did you see what kind of took off from there? It just that, that first couple months when it was going on and we weren't sure. I mean, it, I guess somehow we knew it was OCD, just trying to get a handle on it. I remember I didn't want to label her with it. So even though I had this understanding that that's probably what it was, I didn't want to call it that because I didn't want to label her. And we were trying so many different you know, methods to help her and, and to work through this. 
it was emotionally draining, you know, just, just helping her through this. I don't know, when I look back on it now, I feel like we were so clueless in what we were doing. And because, you know, what I remember is that before all that blew up, she'd been over washing her hands for oh, probably almost a year. And I have a good friend, she has OCD. And she suggested when we talked about Abby's hand washing, that it could be OCD. And I remember thinking, my daughter doesn't have OCD. She's not obsessive about things. You know, that's my older child. He's very obsessive and wants things in order and wants to know what's happening next. I had no idea what OCD really was. You know, I had that mainstream media idea that OCD is some being obsessive about things and that's not what OCD is at all. And so I had someone who, you know, clued in that it could be way before things got really bad. And if we had addressed it then, you know, who knows, you know, I always feel like I wish we could have gotten treatment sooner because the sooner you get it, the worse it gets, the harder a treatment is. And it's just so much more you've got to overcome. So I, I feel like it's important to be an advocate for what OCD really is because there's memes and everything all the time about jokes about OCD. And I wish I was more OCD and thinking it just means being neat and organized and cleaning. And I cringe when I see those things because that kind of message is what kept me from getting my daughter treatment sooner. And I, so I want to educate other parents and other people so we don't continue to perpetuate that myth that OCD is a personality trait. Well, and I know at the, at the time, too, our youngest was really young. I mean, he was still like a year old. Yeah. Year old. How, how did that affect you? I mean, how did that play into it? Well, I, I'm sure that... You know, he, he was at an age where nursing him and caring for him, and he, he needed me very much. And all right about that same time as when I went back to work, too. So it was just, you know, a whole lot of challenges at once. Um, and so I'm sure it was difficult to think through things clearly because I was juggling, you know, a baby and going back to work and getting help for my daughter. I, I, I know that I'm sure it affected him, you know, because Abby went from being easygoing, fun-loving, whatever kind of kid to just freaking out over the littlest things. I mean, it was a big personality change. It was, you know, very flip. And, you know, she had loved her little baby brother, but now all of a sudden she couldn't touch him. And, you know, I'm sure it was confusing to him and he didn't understand. And so I'm sure that was traumatic on him. And it was, you know, traumatic for us because she really, you know, was like, OCD had robbed her of her childhood and her personality and of who she was, especially at the worst it got. It, it was challenging. Speaking of challenges, I mean, what, do you, what would you see as the most challenging part of it? Well, not having the right information about it to get help early enough. I don't know. I, you know, I always go back to that, and that's why I like to speak about this and write about it, is to clue people in, to pay attention to these behaviors and anxiety, you know, people, kids act out in behaviors and we think, oh, it's a behavior problem. We need to fix it. We need to, you know, punish them or take things away. But if it's caused by an anxiety disorder, you know, you can't stop the behavior. You got to get to the root of what the, the problem is. I think a lot of kids out there suffer with OCD and go undiagnosed. And so having that information initially, um, knowing what to do and, and getting the right help from people some of the resources we found later, if we had had them to start out, you know, just having that network of support, I guess. And because it's a mental health illness, people don't understand. You know, if your kid has cancer, it's, oh, let's raise money. Let's send cards. Let's embrace you. You know, and your child has a mental illness. It's like, oh, we'll leave you alone. We don't want to bother you. You know, if you need something, yeah. let us know. But we don't want to disturb you. And it's very isolating. And I remember thinking that as we felt withdrawn from our friends that, you know, if she had cancer or something, people would be reaching out and supporting and, and not that, you know, if we asked them, they wouldn't be supportive, but it, it was very isolating. What do you think was the most challenging part for our daughter? Well, you know, because we didn't label it right away, I think that was detrimental to her because I know it helped once we could say, you know, this is not your fault because I think I'm sure she blamed herself. This is not your fault. This is an illness, like, you know, getting chicken pox or getting the flu. You didn't cause this. And, you know, to, to, to realize, no, this is not you. Like, she thought it was her. And to, to separate herself from, no, this is the OCD, and this is what OCD message is sending you. It's not who you are. And, you know, I think once we got on board with therapy and the right kind of therapist who was doing the ERP therapy with her, and helping her to identify that. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not her. I, you know, 
can't even imagine what it's like to have OCD, and you know, unless you have it. Um, so I've only seen it through her eyes, but I imagine that that was it was tough, and, and you know, at, at such a young age, eight years old, yeah, it was out of control. And how how did you see it? Uh, you know, how do, what were the challenges for the family? I know from my side of it, but I'd like to understand it from your side. What you saw the challenges were as a family? Well, everything kind of revolved around her and her illness. So I know, you know, her older brother was 12, so four years apart. It affected him and our ability to do things for him. It just our time and energy, we were wiped. I remember when we got past the worst of things and we finally had a night where we ate dinner and we felt like we could relax because when OCD was flaring and, you know, it was just getting dinner and then getting people calmed and, and to sleep was exhausting and it often took hours and hours that it just... It was such a drain. It, it just, there was, you know, it took everything out of us to do all that. You know, our, our youngest developed severe social anxiety and OCD as well. And it's like, well, no wonder that, you know, what a traumatic way to, to grow up. So I, I, I'm kind of curious, and, you know, you, you'd mentioned that you saw her washing hands before the, all the, before it kind of clicked really strong, which I remember that night too. I, you know, because we, we, We've kind of come up with the idea that she has pandas, correct? In, in what? Well, we can't identify that exactly. You know, we reached out to practitioners early on about that, and nobody would pursue it with us, um, said it didn't matter, which I don't agree with now. We don't know. I mean, she definitely had signs of it before the severe, you know, it, it came, you know, there were mild symptoms, and then it came on severely, which I guess still could be pandas. She had been over hand washing for a good year. And she had some fears of being poisoned. I have a distinct memory. We had like dance and swimming and we stopped at Chick-fil-A to get something to eat. And she just couldn't eat it. She was so afraid she was being poisoned. So there were signs before then when I look back and like, I remember talking with my friend about, you know, the hand washing and she said it could be OCD. And I literally just blew it off like, no. Um, and so I didn't see those things so clearly until... It, things flared up in last the spring of whatever um goodness she was eight she's 17 now nine years ago about this time of year you know but look then i looked back on it and i saw those other things that were going on and missing those early signs of things in this podcast i've talked a lot about the recovery part like the erp therapy that we went through and, 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 of course, I talk about the help we got from even the naturopathic doctors and different. We did a lot. Of, I mean, I, yeah, you can remember we, we, we were drawing at straws almost trying to figure out what was going to be. Therapy, EFT, yeah. alpha stem, just diet changes. Oh, we went cold turkey off sugar. That was a nightmare because <laughs> sugar is a very addictive substance. And you shouldn't take a child cold turkey <laughs> off sugar because they're going to be climbing the walls to get to the rice milk. And yeah, I, it was, I mean, the diet changes wound up helping the behavior. I lost weight because I went off sugar too. So, you know, people had advised us of that, but you know, someone needed to say, don't, don't do this cold turkey. Yeah. Do um, it moderately. <laughs> that's not a good thing to do for your sanity. Um, but yeah, we were doing a lot of different alternative things and, and trying these different things, but we, you know, we didn't find the therapist till she was like nine. And I really wish we had gotten in way yeah. sooner with, with that. What did you see as your role in the, in her recovery? What can you elaborate we, on that? Well, as we learned about ERP and, you know, we, it took, you know, it did some intensive ERP with her. And because we homeschooled and we're home with her, we were able to do lots of work on it along with weekly therapy sessions. I think the challenge was helping her through it and not getting emotionally involved as her parent. Like, you know, I, I remember reading things later about when you respond, you need to be very calm about it, you know, and it's much, because when we got emotional and she, you know, just it, it just became a power struggle. And so, you know, I learned that through the experience of doing it that way instead of, you know, that it was a challenge to stay calm and help her because you see your daughter struggling and fearful, you, you, you want to, you know, you want to help her feel better. You want to eliminate the fear. But with OCD, that means giving into it, which really in the long run is making it worse. So, you know, and I, I remember realizing how much it was affecting the whole family and, and wanting more family support, you know, that, and at the time, I didn't feel that that was necessarily out there. Like, it would have been great to have a group to go to and talk to other parents who, uh, I, I can't remember when I found the, um, 
parenting and OCD Yahoo group. And it was just awesome to find this. And I didn't find it till I don't know much later, these other parents and parents looking for alternatives and, you know, being cautious with medications with young children and just supporting each other and hearing each other's stories. And, and that was a big help to me recommend that the parent um, parenting and OCD, it's a Yahoo group, but, you know, having support for something like this. And it's, you know, it's great to have all these online resources, but I, you know, it's, there's nothing like to have face-to-face support with people that, you know, yeah. probably would have been really helpful. Well, I, I always credit you with uh, being the one that helped me to understand the calming part, you know, that you used to always say, just remember that inside of that, that little demon or whatever that was in front of us was our daughter, and, and we had to still be compassionate to that. So just throw out a, a, an appreciation and a, a gratefulness to you because you helped me with that a lot and got me back out of the, what I always call my military mode, you know, that <laughs> wanting to just resist and go against it and all that. And, and it's very true, you can't, you can't go with that style. You have to be able to calm and, yeah. you know. Well you, can't, well, you can't just say, stop it, don't do those behaviors, but you also <laughs> can't, like, get mad at, you know, the way you, you know, please stop washing your hands. You know, we need to stop now. And, and doing it in a calm, negotiating way versus, you know, the emotional response of, oh, my God, you're washing your hands again. They're getting so chapped. And, you know, trying to reason with someone who's dealing with OCD <laughs> is the absolute wrong thing to do. You know, you might as well be reasoning with the wall it's it's not going to work and you have to really somehow step outside of the emotion of it and because otherwise you just get into a power struggle and it's not easy to do and i know i would read that and think that but i wasn't always you know able to do it and it definitely made a big difference because if you come back with that strong emotion it just flared everything up even more just escalated mm-hmm. the situation um, but it's challenging when your child is throwing things and threatening you and threatening to hurt themselves and you know, and being loud and yelling. And it, and, you know, it's, when I say all that, it kind of brings me back because it's been a while since we've dealt with that. And it, it was a lot. Well, and half the time it was at 11, 12 o'clock at night, you know, when it, you know, the battles began, you know. and Well, you know. yeah, and she was overtired. And so the OCD was flaring. And, I, you know, I was, we were both exhausted. And, yeah, those were some you- times. You know, one thing that I think for, for us that helped was we, we did a lot of tag teaming, you know, I, I'd work it for, you know, a couple of hours till I was just about, you know, beat against the wall and I'd come up and say, you go for it. And, you know, if you, I think it, in a way that really helped because when you were able to come in calmer, it yeah. seemed to turn the whole thing around, you know? Right, right. Well, I was always very good at when I was removed from it, I could see that you, you know, you weren't doing things calmly. You know, it's always easier to observe that in someone else than, but it helped me go, okay, you know, we can't do it that way. That that's, that's not working. Yeah. So, you know, being removed from it and it helped me to see that, but yeah, I mean, we've kind of tag teamed with our parenting all along anyhow. So yeah, I guess, you know, if you have one parent who's working full time, traveling, gone, you know, large, you know, parts of the day, then the other parent is burdened with that whole responsibility. So sure, I'm sure it, it, it helped to ease that we could do that with, for each other to step away. And that kind of leads me into another thought. I, I want to ask you, you know, what kind of advice you'd give to other mothers. But what the other thing I just thought about is what advice would you give the spouse who doesn't get it, that, that has a hard time with it? What would you, what kind of suggestions might you make to to the other spouse on what you could do to help the other one does it you know what i'm so, so if one 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 parent is understanding the, the diagnosis of cd and what's involved with treatment and they're involved in it and the other parent just doesn't get it like yeah yeah exactly it's a behavior problem they just need to be disciplined yeah um, i mean education you, you need to how does your partner taking information is it videos is it hearing it from another professional is it reading things find what how they learn and take in information and provide them with it in that format you know it might need they need to hear it from another dad or you know mom or you know a professional or they need you know to be educated and I guess being patient because getting angry at them is not going to help anything Um, but I imagine that would be extra trying. I mean, we were both on board with, with things and did it together as a team to get our help. 
So, wow, that just sounds even, you know, more burdening to have, (laughs) you know, a partner finding other resources and support, reaching out to a family, friends, the community, you know, you got to learn to ask for help. Because I know I learned that when, Don, you had a heart attack years ago and, you know, you have to, no matter what's happening in life and this, it's even harder with a mental illness to to ask for help and and to seek those resources. Because, you know, if you're struggling dealing with your child and then your spouse is, you know, on a different page, that's going to add an extra um, challenge to it. But we, we really need to learn to ask for help from other people, whether it's, you know, someone watching the other child, because that, you know, it's hard to parent other children when you're dealing with a child who's flaring, you know, with a severe OCD. Um, it's, it's hard to be there for more than just that child. Well, and I think you what you said about asking is, is big because like you said, you know, there's some isolation that goes on. People, and I, I don't think they do it out of spite. No, you know, they anything, don't realize it. They just see you're struggling just, and the emotions and they like, oh, I don't want to bother you. I don't want to burden you. You've got enough on your plate, but they don't realize. I mean, it's so subtle or, you know, we don't realize how much stigma we have on mental illness and our whole, you know, society, our culture, it, it just has on it versus you know a physical illness when you had a heart attack i had no problem asking people for help it didn't you know it's people like yeah 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 you know because people accept that i don't know what it is you know but in the, with mental illness it, it's different i guess because you feel like it's your fault as a parent i mean we even had a professional tell us that it was our fault yeah people don't realize that saying oh i won't bother you is <laughs> the last thing that you want to hear you know, tell me what I can do to help you make a suggestion, you know, could I take your other child? Because you as a you might not be able to think of what kind of help you need. So to be supportive of other people, you need to step in and, and offer ideas and suggestions or just ask what they could do to help. It's well, a I tough think, one. I think the idea of ed- also educating them a little bit. I mean, not you don't have to do a lot, but just let them know these are the kind of things that are happening. Doing that with um, Abby's friends, I gave sent parents that links about OCD and especially child friendly links to information so they could learn about it and at least understand a little bit yeah. more what she's think- going through. Because um, I remember I presented the idea of talking to her Girl Scout troop and her dance troop. And the dance troop, the dance instructor said, I have to talk to the parents if that was okay. And I, that just really, like, why wouldn't this be okay? She's dealing with this issue. Why can't I educate the other girls, you know, what she's struggling with? And, you know, but it was like, oh, we have to get approval for that because, you know, you know that stigma, it's really, a, you know, a mental illness stigma. I think, the, you know, the Girl Scout troop was fine with me doing it. I just didn't get the you know, to have the energy and, and effort to put it together never happened because I was just exhausted from mm. juggling her and the OCD and, she'll, you know, work and everything. But, yeah, I just I remember I just kept thinking if she had cancer, you know, they'd be sending cards. They'd be, yeah. And just, yeah. just realizing that uh, stigma that's there. But Any last thoughts bef- before we wrap this up? Well, I just think, you know, if you see any signs of, you know, any anxiety in your child to educate yourself. There's some good information on the internet. OCD Foundation website has, you know, great amount of resources, um, you know, and, and really digging and, and digging around for support to not, you know, not necessarily believing the first thing you read on the internet, but trying to find resources and support and um, getting information out there to other people on if um, if you see a child in your life, a family member, a friend's kid that might be showing signs of this, to share some information with them because the sooner they get help and treatment, the easier it is to fight that OCD. The more severe it gets, you know, the more trying it is for, for that child and everyone around them. Well, uh, I know uh, you write a lot about it in your blog, so if, if mm-hmm. you want... Um, if you want to tell the audience what your blog address is, I'll also put it up on the website, but uh, let's go ahead and mention it here too, because you've got a lot of these stories and, and information yeah. up there too. I, yeah, but my, I created my first blog, Gina's Life Journey. So it's um, Gina, G-I-N-A-S, Life, L-I-F-E, Journey, J-O-U-R-N-E-Y, 
www.wordpress.com. So I, that was my first blog site where I started writing about everything. And then I created my child-led learning blog, which is child, C-H-I-L-D, led, L-E-D, learning, L-E-A-R-N-I-N-G, dot wordpress, dot com. And there's more information there because that's geared toward parenting and started with a Focused Healthy Family website to take some of the blogs and, and begin to put them on the Focused Healthy Family um, website as well. Sharing our story, if I can help even one other person, is that's why I write. You know, I write to, it helps me process and make sense of things and understand things and, and for my own growth. And if it can help, you know, even one other person out there, I, I, you know, I feel compelled to just share my experiences and what I'm writing. Well, I'm so glad you, you shared today because it, it, uh, it was a good trip back through, the, <laughs> through our, our story. And um, like you said, uh, it, it always is helpful, I think, to if we can help one or two people even, you know, it's, right. I think that's, that's good. So, so thanks uh, for doing that. I appreciate it. You know, every time we, I write about this, I talk about it, it helps me reflect and realize how far she's come to. Yeah. She still has the issues and things that, but it's like, wow, she's overcome a lot. You know, we've <laughs> gotten through a lot of tough stuff and uh, it, it helps to look back on that to see, you know, and to let other people know, you know, when you're in the thick of it, it feels like, <laughs> you know, this is never going to get any better. It, it, it does and it can. And especially OCD, I think it's one of the more, I don't know if I want to use the word curable, but it's, it, it you can at least get to a place of living a, a, a fairly you know, normal life, I guess, if you want to say it that. Yeah, you know. if the person suffering will get on board with the ERP therapy and, you know, other supportive things that are needed with it, yeah, that it, it, there, there is a good path towards recovery, um, but it's not an easy one. Yeah. But, it's, but, but it, there's help out there. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. So, Thank you. That concludes this podcast. Please leave me a comment or question below. That gives me good direction where to go on future podcasts. I would love to hear your Invisible Wheelchair stories if you are willing to share it. If you would, go to InvisibleWheelchair.com and click on Tell Your Story. I want to remind you that OCD Obsessive Compulsive Disorder is treatable, and I can help you get past OCD. So, if you have heard this podcast and others, and you feel like you need further assistance and would like to spend some time with me working through any issues you have, then feel free to book a session at FocusedHealthyFamily.com or FamilyOCD.com, or you can call me at 704-562-1630. I also offer $85 off initial discovery session if you mention that you heard it on this podcast. Finally, don't forget that there is a tapping recording that coincides with this podcast you may want to take advantage of. I hope you have enjoyed this podcast and will join me for the next one. Remember to keep tapping, talking, and transcending your life to new heights. Thank you and have a great day.